Sanichi studied musicology at the University of Pavia, King's College London, and Cornell University. He was university lecturer in music and then reader in musicology in the music faculty of Oxford University. At the risk of reading what you already have in your hands, I will omit further biographical information in order to get to Professor Sanichi's talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Very grateful for the invitation to talk about something I'm very passionate about, namely opera, um, and specifically about representations of race in opera. You can see the title of my talk is Representing Race in Opera, Text and Performance, Past and Present. Uh, why is it important to talk about race in opera? Well, there are mainly two reasons. The first is that race is important for opera. It's crucial to its poetics, to its representational aesthetics, to its history, especially in the last two centuries. And this is true of most cultural expressions in the so-called West, you know, Euro-America. Race is crucial to who we are, who we have been for the past 200 years and opera is part of who we are. We, we talk about this we, but let's, let's assume we all know what it means um, for the moment. Uh, opera is uh, at the center, really, of artistic expression in the last 200 years, and um, race is very central to its poetics and aesthetics, so it's worth thinking about it. But of course, race is also important for us. Um, today I will concentrate on the former reason, namely race in opera. That's what I do, I work on opera. But I would like nonetheless to pause briefly on the second reason, the importance of race for us. As I said, the issue of race is crucial for present day Western, so-called Western society, but in, of course in very different ways. And who exactly is this us? Us in the so-called West, Euro-America, of course, this is a huge entity made up of different countries with different histories and different presence, different present situations. Countries with different relationships to the history of imperialism, with different geographical locations, with different political situations. Italy is a, has been, for the last few years, at a very sort of sensitive place. Of course, it's in South Mediterranean, closer to Africa and the Middle East than um, other European countries. Um, I don't know if you have heard recently what Austria is planning to do, close with the fence, you know, the main pass, the main border between Italy and Austria because they are afraid about immigrants. But uh, country, the country is not the only parameter. When we think about race, when we think about immigration, we Tend to, think, tend to think about these things in terms of countries, Italy, Austria, France, the UK, and so on and so forth. Uh, in fact, there are other, other parameters worth thinking about when we think about race in contemporary society. The region, even within Italy, there are different attitudes towards, let's for the moment, allied race and immigration. Different attitudes towards immigration, whether we are in Sicily or we are in Lombardy, whether in the south and in the north. Um, city versus countryside, even today, 2016, in this globalized world, um, immigrants are perceived and treated differently whether you are in a small village in the, Al in the Alps, on the Apennines, or in a big city. Social class, of course, is also a, a very significant parameter when we talk about race. Uh, so uh, just a general invitation, suggestion really, no, nothing more than that, to take to never take that we, that us, for granted, but always interrogate it, ask ourselves, what do we really mean when we talk about we and us? But that's it as far as race in general is concerned. I said, as I said, race, race is central to modern opera, really. Um, opera's relationship with the present, with our own culture and society is unique among the arts, and specifically, specifically the performing arts. And this is, in a sense, the most important point of my talk, I think. Um, um, the issue, why is opera um, 
unique among the arts in its relationship to present day culture. Here the question, the issue is that of repertory. Opera is 400 years old, but for the first 200 years, um, if you went to the theater, you wanted to hear, you were expected to hear, and what you got was a new work. You went back the following year, and you had another new opera, and the following year, another or two new operas. You were always hearing new pieces. What happened, it's a long-term change, between the late 18th century and the early 20th century, so it took more than a century, is that slowly that changed to the, to the point of the present situation when when we go to the opera, we see old works, works composed 100, 150, 200, 250, 300, 400 years ago. Um, the reasons for this are too complex and really we are not interested in them today. But this means that opera, unlike any other artistic form in the West, or at least any other performing art, deals with the past more. You know, the past is particularly present when it comes to opera, because when we go to opera, when we watch a DVD, when we hear an aria, we are dealing with stuff composed, thought, conceived in the past. The issue of repertory is also, of course, true in part of spoken theater, because of course we go to the theater and we go to see Shakespeare. Shakespeare wrote this place 400 years ago. He died 400 years ago exactly earlier this week, last week, I don't remember. But um, in spoken theater, the ratio of new works is much, much higher than in opera. I mean, if you go to see an opera nowadays, chances are, chances are that 95, 97% of cases, you get old work. You see a work composed a long time ago. If you go to a spoken theater, Perhaps your chances are 50, 50, 60, 40. You, know, you get a completely new play, you get Shakespeare, you get some Pirandello, you know, Chekhov, or whatever, but you get a lot of stuff written in the past five, 10, 15, 20, 50 years. Um, um, and this is, as I said, not true of opera. So the past just is with us all the time when we deal with opera. Um, also, something that differentiates opera from spoken theater, and not even to mention cinema, of course, is that um, the practice and the aesthetics of performance have developed in opera in really unique ways. What has happened is that, again, for reasons too complicated that don't concern us today, the verbal text, the words, and the musical text, the notes, are thought to be unchangeable, untouchable. Unlike spoken theater, if you go to see Shakespeare today, it's extremely rare that you will see the entire text, that actors will act the entire text that you can read in a printed edition of Hamlet, say. Um, directors cut, substitute, reorder, change. They do all sorts of things. This, for various reasons, is, is considered um, impossible with opera. If you represent an opera, if you perform an opera today, you have to use the same words and the same music as the composer and the librettist conceived and set to music back in the past. Where you can intervene is on the visual side of things. The visual aspect is the one on which we can intervene. It's the least fixed and in all sorts of ways the least fixable of the three languages of opera. The words, the music, and the images, the acting, the performance. Therefore, opera in our world, in our culture, is constitutionally, is uniquely predicated on the presentness of opera, on the tension between past and present. The past is more strongly felt than in any other performing art, and perhaps art in general. The past has a particularly strong, lively, powerful present, we are constantly confronted with history when we deal with opera. That is to say, we are constantly conf confronted with difference, with people, with texts, with music that was conceived in words that are different on the present day. 
in particularly vivid ways, in particularly strong ways, opera is a very strong artistic expression. It of, it, its point is to overwhelm us, you know, to, 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 to awash us you know, in emotions, in impact, in, 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 yes, in psychological effect. Um, but at, within it, there is this tension between text and music, unchangeable or thought to be unchangeable, and the visuals that are ever more subjected to interpretation. More and more directors now take a critical or a, say, dialogic view of what they are setting. Um, and we will get to this point um, later, but this is a source of tension within opera today, a potentially productive tension, but also a potentially disruptive tension, especially when it comes to issues that are deeply felt in our present day world, such as race, of course, gender, sexual orientation, social class, you know, all these huge, hugely important issues in, present, in the present day, um, bring up all sorts of tensions that are difficult to deal with when it comes to opera. What has happened, what rather, what, how, the way we can approach this tension is twofold, I'd suggest. Um, one is through historical knowledge, just to think about what these operas meant when they were first conceived and performed in the past. Think about what gender, what race, what sexual orientation, what social class meant in 1800, in 1850, in 1900, in 1950. And this is what we are here today for, you know, to deepen our historical knowledge, in a sense. The other, of course, the other kind of negotiation that we can establish with um, opera is through performance. When we stage opera, we stage it for today. And so inevitably, we have to think hard about what we want to get out of this staging. Why do we stage what we stage and how? So negotiations can happen, say, in the classroom, in a sense, or by, while reading a book and thinking, and in the theater or watching a DVD. So through historical knowledge and through performance, the practice of performance, there are various strategies, of course, both historically, in terms of historical knowledge and in terms of performance. Um, performance has its own history, of course. You know, opera is not performed in 2016 the way it was performed even 20 years ago, in 1996, not to mention you know, 50 or 70 or 100 years ago. Um, again, I would uh, suggest that we think about place as a very important parameter, contextual parameter. Different meanings um, can emerge in different situations, in different locales, in different countries, in different institutions. Meaning, as, as a Professor Romain used to say, meaning is context bound, but context is boundless. So meaning is always dependent on a precise context, but this context cannot be precisely defined. So every time we think about the history of opera, every time we think about the performance of opera and the history of the performance of opera, we have to ask ourselves when, where, for whom exactly. So thinking about these issues, I have um, um, structured, organized my talk today in two parts. The first historical, and the second about performance. So I will have a brief historical perspective followed by uh, some thoughts about uh, performance. And in the end, we will end up seeing a few scenes from two productions of Madame Butterfly and discuss them. Um, okay. um, I will concentrate for the brief historical survey, I will concentrate on Italian opera because we are in Italy, because uh, Italian opera is the main, the most important uh, tradition, national tradition of opera. Uh, when it comes to race, now I will make, I, will, I should say, I will make huge historical generaliz generalizations here. You know, I'm trying to discuss the history of race in opera in about 10 minutes, less. 
so I will, uh, I will make huge historical generalizations. But I think it's fair to say that the representation of race for the first two centuries of opera, the 17th and the 18th century, is not particularly significant. Race is not uh, is a significant element in opera for about two centuries. And the reasons are political and social. Um, um, uh, opera is a European phenomenon, is a European artistic expression. And in the 17th and 18th century, the contact between Europe and other parts of the world was significantly less sustained, less intense than would happen uh, later on. Um, there are certainly characters from, from other places outside Europe, uh, from far away, what used to be called exotic places, that appeared on the stage, but they are not, these characters are not racialized in any meaningful way. Um, and pretty much the only uh, other place that is represented on opera, on the operatic stage in the first 200 years of its history, especially the 18th century, is the so-called Middle East. And this is fairly obvious historically. The most sustained contact that Europe had with non-Europe was with the Middle East. Uh, the Ottoman uh, Empire at some point in the late 17th century arrived at Vienna, uh, very, very close to the, to the center of Europe. Um, for, for centuries, Europe had had to deal with, with the Ottoman Empire uh, and so on. And um, so that was the other of Europe was the Middle East. Um, this, we can see the sort of tail end of this at the time when issues of, generally speaking, race start to come into Italian opera. And this is in the early 19th century. We have two examples here, two comedies, Gioacchino Rossini's, Angela Anelli's L'Italiano in Algeria, 1813, and Rossini's and Romani's in Turco in Italia, Italian girl in Algiers and the Turk in Italy, uh, one year apart. Again, these are exotic encounters. I don't think we can quite yet talk about race when we talk about Rossini's comedy. But something had happened uh, right before that started to change things from Euro for Europe and therefore for European opera. And that is Napoleon's expedition, so-called, to Egypt, 1798-99. is the moment when uh, things really change between Europe and its others, so to speak. Um, I'm not sure, I'm sure I don't need to discuss Orientalism, the idea of Orientalism with you, you have probably encountered it before. It's a very famous book by uh, Edward Said, an, an American intellectual who um, ori uh, was originally from Palestine. Um, and he, dis he presented it, he, he, he theorized it as the way in which the so-called West constructs an identity for itself in opposition to another that is oriental, quote unquote. Basically, if Said, Said said, there is no West without an East. The East is there to make the West West. You know, we construct our identity as not the other. We have, of course, we could talk about this meaning of East, but um, it's interesting that th when, when something that approaches a sort of a racialized, racial, racialized, racial imagination in Italian opera uh, happens in the early 19th century, right after Napoleonic, Napoleon's expedition to Egypt. Um, quickly, uh, so the first encounter uh, between Italian opera and race is through the Middle East. Then, later on in the century, we have another racialized other in Italian opera is the gypsy, gypsy, and quote unquote the gypsy, of course. This is the term that indicates the um, construction of Romani, uh, the Ro Rome population. Uh, so it's not racist to say gypsy because it refers to the European construction imagined, of course, not real, 
of the Romani population, Rome population. And we encounter the gypsy in Verdi's Il Trovatore, 1853. Um, again, it's really difficult to hear anything in the music that makes the character in Il Trovatore, Azucena, the gypsy character in Il Trovatore, different. Her music is not in any substantial way different from that of the other quote unquote white characters. The uh, case of Verdi Zumballo in Maschera is very, very interesting. Um, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, I, even if I'm talking about Italian opera, I cannot fail to mention the crucial opera for the uh, representation of the gypsy, i.e. Bizet's Carmen, 1875, which is a French opera, of course, but is absolutely crucial to, to the racialization, if you want, of the gypsy. Uh, it was hugely popular in Italy and all over Europe and, in fact, all over the West, and it had a huge impact on the imagination, the image of the gypsy, quote unquote. The case of Verdi Zumballo in Maschera, in Maspo, is very interesting because originally this opera was set in Sweden in the late 19th, 18th century, 1792. Um, and there is a character in it which is a fortune teller named Ulrika. And there is no, in the libretto, she, she has no, no, there is no mention of a race. She's just a fortune teller, a bit of a witch if you want, but not really racialized. Um, for problems with censorship, basically, um, uh, the opera was, had to change locale. And instead of being set in um, Stockholm in Sweden in 1792, it had to be moved to Boston in the uh, 17th century, late 17th century. You see, you see in Ballet Maschera and Maspol appears on the um, next slide. Why? Because once the opera was moved to Boston, this fortune teller became black. She became an Af African American, I think it's fair to say, an African American character. Um, in the original libretto, at some point there is a line that talks about her pallid brow. This was, um, had to be changed uh, by the original librettist for, again, it was censored, the, the libretto, for political reasons, basically. And once the action was set to Boston, was moved to Boston, this line was changed to her dark brow. So in the libretto, there is no question that she is African-American, has acquired a racial identity. The issue is that I think it's fair to say that this doesn't transfer to the music. There is nothing in the music that speaks of race in the case of the character of the fortune teller, Ulrika, that makes her, quote unquote, black. Um, it's interesting because um, um, there is a staging manual, basically a booklet that tells you how to stage Umbaldo in Mascara, published exactly at the time of the, um, of the first performance, Rome, 1859. And there are, there are no references to the race of this character in the staging manual. He says, uh, she is repeatedly called the fortune teller with no reference to race. Uh, we have visual evidence. I, fortunately, I don't have uh, the costume sketches for the first performance, but she's wh white. You know, she's, not, she's, not, she's not racialized. She's not black, quote unquote, in this, in this um, uh, sketches for the costumes for the first performance. And um, there are commentators that write about this opera soon after its premiere and says, one in particular says, the role of the, of the gypsy is too similar to that of Trovatore. This tells us that even in, in early performances, she was not painted black, she was not blackened up. Uh, she was, uh, so that um, even, even in the libretto, she is indicated as black. Is, so the audiences did not pick up on this 
because it did, is not thematized in the opera. Hmm? This, though, um, um, is not, I mean, things will change pretty soon. Because in two subsequent operas by Verdi, Aida, I made a mistake there, it's not 1875, it's 1871. Uh, Aida, which is set in ancient Egypt, and Othello, which is of course based on Shakespeare's Othello, 1871, 1887, there is no question that the race of Aida and her father, in the case of Aida, they are Egyptian, uh, excuse me, Ethiopian slaves in Egypt, and Othello, of course, there is no question <clears throat> that race becomes central, not only to the story, not only to the libretto, but also to the music, in ways that I don't have time to get into at the moment. Um, <clears throat> Finally, the other place when to where Italian opera goes in search of race, in, in search of others, is East Asia. And three representative titles here as Marscagni's Iris, 1898, Puccini's Madame Butterfly, we'll see more of that later, 1904, and Puccini's Turandot, left incomplete when Puccini died in 1924 and performed for the first time two years later in 26. The case of Turandot is a bit different because Turandot is a, it's a, it's a fable, it's a, it's a fairy tale. But Butterfly and Iris are more interesting because <clears throat> they are set in the present. It is both in Japan, Turandot is set in China, but Iris and Madame Butterfly in Japan, set in the present. Iris, in the case of Iris, all the characters are Japanese. There are no Westerners. In the case of Butterfly, uh, what we witness is an encounter between Western and Japanese characters, which is for, in which race is absolutely central to the text, to the music, uh, in, in ways that uh, we'll discuss in a moment. Um, so um, the century when it really happens is the 19th. We have seen about uh, 100 years, 110 years. Uh, is then that the 19th century is when race becomes central to Italian opera, and I would say to opera in general. And of course, the 19th century is the century of imperialism, is when Europe uh, European um, nations established uh, um, colonial empires, colonial empires in India, in Africa, in East Asia, in South America, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so you see how race in opera is closely tied to uh, political, social, um, diplomatic, military history. Let's move now from history to performance. F let's talk about actual singers, not characters. So far we've talked about characters. Now let's talk about singers. Hmm? The history of singers in general is yet to be written largely. My colleagues and I have focused on composers, first of all, and librettists, less so on performers. But, um, <clears throat> um, it's a very interesting history. It's a very important history. And I just here decided to focus very briefly on the history of African-American opera singers in the 20th century. Because it's a history that is not told enough, I think. And I've chosen to show them to you, to actually to see their faces. Um, I've just selected a few of them because they are particularly important in the history of operatic performance, but also in the history of um, uh, race and race relations, particularly in the United States of America. So this is Todd Duncan, bass baritone. He was the first African-American to sing with a major opera company, and the first African-American to sing in an opera with an otherwise white cast. This was at New York City Opera in 1945. Now, African-American singers had been singing opera for about a century, but what they sang was operatic excerpts, arias, duets, during concerts, or they sang in all African-American companies, touring companies, usually. 
there was no mixing on stage. Um, Todd Duncan was the first to sing in a sort of major national opera company, the New York City Opera, in 1945. Marian Anderson, the most well-known, best known of them all. First African-American to sing at the Metropolitan Opera, which is considered the major American opera company, perhaps the major opera company in the world, really. In 1955, in the role of Ulrika, though, eh? they allowed her to sing when she was already in the late 50s, so sort of at, really at the end of her career in all sorts of ways, and in the role of Ulrika, in Verdi Zumbalo in Maschera, uh, the fortune teller that becomes black in the final version of the opera. So they cast an African-American singer in the character of a black, a black character. Uh, this picture is uh, very interesting because it shows her singing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. We are in April 1939. What happened was that um, <clears throat> she had originally been um, invited to sing in Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. But the Daughters of the American Revolution, this sort of society group of, um, well, well-to-do women, let's call them, um, denied her the possibility to do so because she was African-American. And uh, this led to a huge brouhaha. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of the president, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, resigned from the Daughters of the American Revolution because of this. She wrote a scathing letter. I have it there. I don't have time to read it. Um, and so what they, uh, what, they sort of, what they organized instead was for her to sing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. 75,000 people showed up. There are other pictures that show sort of area in front of the Lincoln Memorial, absolutely covered with people, hence all those microphones, because otherwise, of course, they couldn't hear her. Marian Anderson is really the uh, central figure for 20th century African American opera singers. This is Matty Wilda Dobbs, uh, died a few months ago, age 90. She died in December, last December. First African American to be offered a long-term contract, eight seasons at the Met, in 1956, so a year after. Anderson debuted. Also, the first African American uh, singer of African descent to sing at La Scala, the major opera company in Italy, two years earlier in 1955. This is Leontine Price, wonderful picture from the 1960s, uh, still very much with us. First African American soprano to become African American to become a real star at the Met in the 1960s. Also, she sang Cleopatra in Samuel Barber's Anthony and Cleopatra. The opera, the new opera that opened the new Met at Lincoln Center in 1966. The Met used to be on Broadway and 39th in Manhattan. But Lincoln Center was built in the 60s, and in 1966 they opened it, and unfortunately they tore down the old Met. It doesn't exist any longer. I, there is an office building now on, on Broadway and 39th, between 39th and 40th. And she was chosen to open the new Met. And she had a, I mean, she had sort of abusive phone calls and letters about this. Huh? Whom do you think you are? I will not repeat the kind of, I mean, she, she explains it, the kind of abuse she was subjected to when she, because of this. This is Grace Bunbury, who, who loves, again, very, very much with us. She loves sports cars, and there she's driving one. There is a documentary made on her in the 1960s, and this is a, a still from that documentary. First African-American soprano, uh, African-American to sing at the Bayreuth Festival in Germany. Bayreuth Festival is the festival that is devoted to the works of Richard Wagner. Uh, sort of, in all sorts of ways, Wagner is closely identified with the Nazi regime. I mean, he died much earlier, but uh, Hitler loved Wagner operas, and of course, we know about the Nazis and race. Um, so Bayreuth had been a bastion of racism, really. But in 1961, they invited her to sing the Earl of Venus in Wagner Stanhäuser, so a landmark, really, in all sorts of ways. And finally, Lawrence Brownlee, star at the most prestigious opera houses in the world, including the Met. We see him in Donizetti's Total of a Regiment at the Met uh, three or four years ago. 
Um, I had a short clip of uh, Grace Bambri um, telling us about issues of makeup, uh, the, the, the problems of makeup when, when you sing opera and you have a darker skin. And I thought it was interesting, but we don't have time for that at the moment, unfortunately. Um, what, what I'd like to do now is um, to move back to history and focus briefly on the case study of Butterfly. Um, Madame Butterfly Puccini, 1904. Um, this is the original poster. As you will see on the poster, right below Butterflies, it says Tragedia Japonese, a Japanese tragedy. Now, this is very odd. What is odd about it? Want to make a suggestion? Have you ever have you ever heard Hamlet described as a, a Danish tragedy, or Macbeth as a Scottish tragedy? Well, the Scottish play. People who don't want to say Macbeth because it brings bad luck, they say the Scottish play. But why Japanese? Why they need to explain Japanese? Tragedia Japonese is extremely strange. Not so strange if we think about the fact that the fact that it takes place in Japan and some of these characters are Japanese is absolutely crucial to the dramaturgy of the opera. Japan had come to the center of European Western imagination at the end of the 19th century. Uh, there were exhibitions in Paris in 1857, in 1900. We have already seen Mascagni's Iris. What is it? Here, 1898, another opera on Japan. Um, <clears throat> this is interesting, the poster, because what, what's, what's significant about it? What do you think is a bit strange about this poster? This is the original poster for the opera, 1904, designed by the publisher of the opera, Ricordi. What is, doesn't anything strike you as rather odd? Any suggestions? Hmm. Yes. Um, sorry. I think it's strange that the only character I guess portrayed is a Japanese woman, and she's portrayed in like the traditional Japanese clothes that you would think about when you think of the Japanese tragedy. And then there's the stereotypical cherry blossoms outside the window, mm -hmm. and then her kneeling outside a screen window. So it just kind of plays on what you would think when you think of Japanese tragedy. Absolutely, there are all sorts of markers that highlight her sort of national and possibly racial identity, yes. Uh, well, I don't think it's strange to show, oh, thank you. I don't think it's strange to show anything about Japan or the Japanese culture because the play is based in Japan, or, you know, Japanese. What I think is strange is that you don't really get to see the character's face. Exactly. Exactly. You don't see her face. You don't see her face. Um, so you have only external accoutrements, if you want, of locale. Even if you want, you have the external markers of race, but you don't have what we tend to think as the crucial bit, the body. You, know. you cannot tell the race of this, of this person. You can tell that it takes place in Japan, but it could be a European woman dressed as a Japanese. You don't see her face precisely. And this, um, it's interesting because it introduces our, it helps us introduce to, the, to how race is represented in Madame Butterfly, um, precisely with all sorts of um, a multiplicity of positions, a multiplicity of strategies of representation. What we have here is an exchange between Pinkerton and Sharpless. Pinkerton is an American naval officer who arrives in Nagasaki, 1904, and um, is going to be stationed there for a while, and he wants company at night, basically. So he buys a young Japanese bride, 
says, yeah, I'm getting married for 1,999 years, except that I can end my contract every month. Now, basically, I have to give a month's notice. When I'm tired of her, I can say, thank you, pay her till the end of the month. This is, um, well, imagine any sort of Western man going to uh, African country, say, for oil extraction and being stationed there a couple of years and finds a local girl to keep in company and when he leaves, he leaves. That is the kind of story we are dealing with. And in fact, he says so, you know, the, uh, he, he's talking to the, with the uh, American consul in Nagasaki, Sharpless. So, so non so, non so, depend on the grado di cottura. I'm, uh, love or passing fancy, I couldn't say. She strangely bewitched me with her innocent arts. Delicate and fragile as blown glass, in stature, in bearing. She resembles some figure on a painted screen. But as from her background of glossy lacquer, with a sudden movement, she freezes herself. She frees herself. Like a butterfly, she flutters and settles with such quiet grace that a madness sees me to pursue her, even though I might damage her wings. Now, how does he describe butterfly? He's talking about her. He's explaining to the consul the kind of emotions and feelings he feels. He talks about her as if she were a thing. He reifies her as, she, as if she were an object, an animal. She's a butterfly. She's, a, she's, a, she's painted on a screen. Um, the crucial word here is furor, the penultimate line. Pure, translator here says madness. And seized by this fear to pursue her, to, to get her, even if I have to bring her, break her wings. Now, this is racist. This is majorly racist talk. She is objectified into an object. You know, the, the supposed characteristics of her race, as they are discussed even earlier on in the opera, are made into, she's not a person, she's a representative of a specific race here. Now, the consul, on the other hand, the day before yesterday she came to visit the consulate. I didn't see her myself, but I heard her speak. The mystery of her voice touched me to the heart. Through love, surely speaks like that. It'd be a great sin to strip off those delicate wings and perhaps plunge a trusting heart into despair. That heavenly, meek, pretty little voice shouldn't utter a note of sadness. You see how Butterfly presents you with different points of view. Pinkerton, who is very much the villain in this opera, racializes, turns Butterfly into a thing, essentializes her, her as a representative of the Japanese quote-unquote race. Sharpless says, what does Sharpless do? He hasn't seen her. He doesn't talk. You know, where, whereas Pinkerton sees, Sharpless hears. He talks about her voice. Sharpless, Pinkerton talks about furor, and Sharpless talks about l'amor. Certo, quando è sincero, l'amor parla così. True love surely speaks like that. And of course, we are in an opera, so voice comes at a premium. Voice is really important in opera. So what Sharpless is saying, who is also American, she's the Ameri he's the American consul in Nagasaki, he's saying, she has a voice that makes her a person with depth of feeling, with depth of emotion. She's not an object, she's not an animal, like you, Pinkerton, I describe in her. Pinkerton asks, yes, yes, my dear consul, you take a pessimistic view, there's no great harm done if I want those things to be spread in love's tender flight. He, you know, Pinkerton is not stupid, picks up the, the love talk of, of the consul. And then says, Al giorno in cui mi sposerò, let's, let's raise a glass to the day when I shall get married in real, in convey an author, with real, in a real wedding marriage to a real American bride. Mm. This is a play. You know, I'm playing at getting married here. Um, now, uh, we don't have much time left, but um, I'd like to show you um, two different stagings. Madame Butterfly, uh, which are um, 
particularly interesting the way they stage race, they deal with race. The first one is the right-hand one, uh, Robert Wilson, great American director, artist, very famous. He has done avant-garde productions of plays, of dance, of uh, all sorts of things, including opera. For, uh, he has been stating things for 40 years, I think. Robert Wilson, great, in fact, great uh, lower Manhattan intellectual. You know, he's lived there all his life. Um, the original production is 1993, the Paris Opera, but this was taped uh, in Amsterdam at the Netherlands Opera in 2008. Now let's see how Wilson stages this exchange. Stop here. Um, before we turn to the staging, have you heard how different the music for Pinkerton and the Consul is? He is his music is. I teach this. I teach Butterfly um, at my university regularly, and I call it uh, sort of, if if I can say so, the music of erection. He's basically excited. Huh? He's he's uh, you know he's thinking about one thing clearly. Huh? When we come to the consul and he talks about voice, the music becomes almost religious. It's like a chorale, you know, something you sing in church almost. What happens when they two sing together is that Puccini goes back and forth between his music, Pinkerton's music, and uh, Sharpless music, and the consul music, presenting us with two different views of Butterfly. One profoundly racialized, the other, no grants individuality to butterfly beyond race, beyond nationality, beyond anything. Um, what about the staging?
This is another character, Goro, the one to the left, is a servant. What about the staging? What is, where did Wilson draw the, his inspiration for this staging? It depends, you know, I mean, um, it's, uh, we are certainly not in your standard Western locale. Uh, these kind of gestures, these kind of movements are inspired by Japanese theater. Various, various kinds of ritual Japanese theater, Buto in particular, but also, you know, Kabuki as well and so on and so forth. So what Wilson does, he basically erases race. This is a genius in all sorts of ways. So he takes, you know, everybody, including the Westerners, you know, behave like Japanese in a sort of ritualized Japanese way. There is no racial, no visualization, no racial visualization. Race is not visualized because everybody belongs together in a sense. You know, Wilson is clearly uncomfortable with the representation of race in Madame Butterfly. So he says, fine, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm turning everybody into you know, the Japanese, quote unquote Japanese. Now, let's look at a completely different um, solution. Um, yes, this one, uh, just so that you can briefly view what I'm talking about. No, no. Damiano Micheletto, Italian director, Teatro Reggio Turin, original 2012, this was taped in 2014. Um, let's look at the same scene and then briefly at the very end of the opera. Not, not this one, not this one, but this one. Just bear with me a second. Conta grazietta sì, la statura, amore a grillo a dire non saprei, c'è la costei, ma con l'ingegno e arte e il pescato, pieve quale tempo e quello soffiato, alla statura. All'appuntamento, sembra figura da paravento, ma dal suo lucido fondo di latta, come fa subito poco si stacca, ma il pare un palletta scolanza e cosa, con tal grazietta silenziosa, e di ritornerà. See how he talks about his real American bride. 
sposerò con vere nozze. So what does Micheletto do here? Where are we? Come on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, wh where are we? Where, where do you think we are? In which kind of, we are in a city clearly, but where? Which part of the world? Oh, at Tokyo. Huh? Uh, like if I had to guess a city, I'd say like Tokyo. Because Tokyo, it's... yes. Uh, there, is an element, there is an element of sexual tourism here, which might not speak of Japan so much as perhaps Thailand or something. Mm -hmm. But clearly we are in the present in a city where Western men go there to sexually exploit you know, young local women. Mm -hmm. How does Micheletto deal with uh, um, Pinkerton's attitude? How, he, how does he visualize this? You know, he, Remind, remember, Pinkerton talks about butterfly as a thing. What, what does he do? Yeah. Dolls. dolls, yeah. But he throws, the, he throws a doll to the ground. So the consul, who has a different idea, picks up the doll and sort of takes care of it, in a sense, sort of rescues, uh, presents a different view, a different attitude. Um, so we see two completely different ways of dealing with the representation of race. One erases it in a very interesting way, uh, placing it in a sort of ritualized idea, theatrical idea of Japan, and the other sort of faces up to it, sort of takes it on directly and problematizes it. Now, briefly, very briefly, I'd like to to show you the end of Micheletto. We don't have time to see the end of, of uh, Robert Wilson's. But at the very end, what does a butterfly do at the end? She commits suicide, she kills herself. Basically, so that she can sort of, she can't deal with the fact that she has had a son with Pinkerton and they want to take it away from the, 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 the little kid, away from her. She can deal with it, but also by killing herself, she sort of erases herself from the life of a child who will, be taken to America and grow up as an American. Because it says in the opera, the child is blonde with blue eyes, despite being the, the child of a Japanese woman and an American man. Um, in, in the original opera, she um, has a, a final sort of farewell, very emotional farewell to her child, and then sends the child away and she kills herself. Now let's see what Micheletto does and especially focus on the very final thing we see. Just a second, I have to... myself so you can, you can forget me. I release you from me. So 
Go play. So, um, think about that last image. What was described as an absolutely blinding light that left only um, the skeletons of buildings? Remember, we are in Nagasaki here. A light has had never been seen, totally blinding, that then left only skeletons of buildings. Nagasaki. The atomic, the atomic bomb, 1945. This is an image. This is actually Hiroshima, not Nagasaki, after the bomb. So what is Micheletto doing here, you think? What is he trying to do? the director, what is he trying to make us think about? Come on. Guilt, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Guilt is a, guilt is a, it's a strong word. I, I think he's not, he's not into guilt, not so much guilt, yes. Um, I think he's trying to make a parallel between um, the racist attitude of the, like, Pinkleton when he goes to something as destructive as an atomic bomb. Yeah. No. He's trying, to, again, um, in my talk, I've sort of gone back and forth between history and the present. So what Micheletto is doing is staging in the present history, Nine, you know, when Puccini set Madame Butterfly in 1904 in Nagasaki, he had no idea what would happen in Nagasaki uh, 41 years later, the atomic bomb. So what Micheletto is, is saying, is saying is, what Micheletto is doing is saying, we cannot take Madame Butterfly, stage Madame Butterfly, as if the century that separates ourselves from it had not happened. You know? Something actually crucial happened something absolutely destructive, absolutely unthinkable happened in Nagasaki 41 years later after. You know, so he sets it in the present, but in his stage, and he incorporates history, he gives us a, the final image of the blinding light 
that left consequence only the skeleton. You see, we see only the skeleton of the kind of cage in which butterfly is, is entrapped. So he's inviting us. I don't think he's trying to make us feel guilty, but he's certainly telling us that we cannot forget history. We cannot forget what this means or can mean for us now. So in a sense, um, he leaves us with questions. He offers us um, sort of things, thoughts, suggestions, something to, thi to, to, to think about. What he's doing, I think, is trying to establish a dialogue with Butterfly through history. So I think uh, this seems, a, a, um, and so I think a useful point on which to end, the invitation to keep the dialogue going about race, about race in opera, thinking about history and thinking about our present. Thank you. So I went on a bit, sorry. Thank you. Um, I have a question about um, the people that they chose to portray the, the characters. So um, from what I saw, I think Madame Butterfly was uh, Caucasian. Yes. And the child was of Asian descent. The child, I'm not quite sure. Um, not entirely sure. Uh, but yeah. Go but on. in other parts, they did have um, like Asian Asian people like playing the roles. For example, like in um, the scene where we thought it was Tokyo, mm -hmm. they had like background characters. So I was wondering, yes. like, um, like when when it was directed and like why they chose certain people to portray the roles. Yeah, um, you have touched upon a sort of um, very important point: casting. You know, racing casting. Uh, what used to happen was that non-Caucasian singers. Um, could sing in operas um, with otherwise white companies, white, quote unquote, Caucasian um, colleagues on stage, other singers, because uh, if and only if they um, perform characters of the same race, so to speak. So um, African-American singers, when they were admitted on major operatic stages in the US, they were singing Aida, Aida mostly, African-American um, soprano sang Aida, Leontine Price, for example. Um, and only later on, they sort of were able to break out of this sort of typecasting and uh, portray Caucasian characters. Uh, this is to, uh, the same is true of Butterfly. Uh, Eastern, East Asian sopranos started singing in the West only uh, Butterfly, Iris, and the very few other uh, roles that were uh, in the, in where the characters were um, East Asian. Um, I think that uh, opera companies are moving increasingly toward colorblind casting, but not only that. Um, so let's say that they are not no longer attempting to make the singers look the right, the correct, quote unquote, race according of the character. Namely, Otellos in Verdi's Otello are ever more, um, they can be, they are usually Caucasian singers, but they look, they are not blackened up or anything like that. Um, in the case of Butterfly, that is increasingly true. The only thing they do here is put a wig. No, she is an Italian soprano, Marilinizza, and they put a wig on her. Um, historically, there, are, there have been many uh, sort of, um, Japanese or East Asian sopranos who have sung Butterfly in, in the West, in Italy, very frequently. This is a very delicate point. I really don't have Sort of, to, I, do, I really don't have an answer. I, I can point you to present uh, the, the way theatrical practices are evolving. The trend is, toward, is ever more toward uh, 
blind, colorblind casting. Um, here, I'm slightly uncomfortable of the fact that she's Caucasian and the non-singing girls, the supers, are East Asian uh, because um, it establishes, in, it inevitably establishes this kind of hierarchy, right? Uh, the other thing to be said is that video really changes things because in the theater, you notice much, much less. But when you see something, opera is not made for close-ups, it's not made for video. She's supposed to be 15. She's clearly not 15. The singer here was about 40 when she sang this. Uh, as soon as you bring video into opera, all uh, sorts of complications arise of credibility. I think one of the great things about opera is that it's not realistic, that you can have 40-year-old women singing 15-year-old characters, 15-year-old girls. And that's all right. And unfortunately, video goes against that because as soon as you start videoing things, you place them in the context of TV series, cinema, the kind of realism that we are used you know, in film and in TV series where if you are 15, well, not quite because in TV series, a 15-year-old uh, young woman is usually performed by a 20-year-old actress, actor, 22, not quite 15, eh? but close enough. And opera is great precisely because it doesn't normally require that kind of realism. But as soon as you start videoing it, these things get in the way. And for example, you notice the difference between the supers and the main character. And you notice that she's clearly not uh, East Asian. And that creates a tension. I, I wouldn't know what else to say, but you're absolutely right. It's a point to be brought up and to be thought about. Yes. Um, how do you think it affects opera, the fact that the operas are always sung in Italian um, and that the music only is supposed to give the exoticness and not necessarily mm. the language? Mm. Mm. Well, yes, that's... That's interesting. Uh, that's why in my very brief historical survey, I emphasized the fact that uh, whether the music does or does not, you know, sort of a take on, so try to represent race. Because um, first of all, even if the operas are sung in Italian, in Italy, I who have been going on to opera since I, since I was eight. I understand on good nights, 50% of what is sung on good nights, often less. But that's, that's normal. Opera composers knew that. You know, they composed around it, so you get the important bits. Nonetheless, you don't get you know, everything in, in the text. And if the music doesn't sort of ignore something in the text, you, you don't get it, right? In, in, in countries where the native, um, native language is not Italian, um, um, Historically, all sorts of things have been overlooked if they were not in the music. Now, again, things have changed with supertitles. You know, uh, now we read a translation. In Italy, even now, you see the Italian text projected. You know, um, so that I go to the opera and I say, oh, really? Oh, they said that. Yeah, it happens to me all the time. I had noticed, I'd never noticed that. And so the text becomes much, much more important than it was originally the case. And it's a different way of consuming, you know, of, of consuming opera, it's going to the opera. You mind the words much more, they mean much more. Historically, you perhaps read the libretto if you really did things thoroughly. You read the libretto before going to the opera. But after that, it's not as if you, you know, you were there at the opera reading the libretto. It was too dark to begin with. So, you know, what, the, the music is to be more important than it is now. You know? And in fact, what happens is that um, in, uh, when opera is performed in countries where the native language is not the one sung, say Italian opera outside Italy, German opera outside Germany, and so on and so forth, um, particularly uh, potentially offens offensive racist expressions in the libretto are censored in the translation. 
and I think, frankly, rightly so, rightly so. Um, it's not as if we are depriving people or anything, you know. The libretto is online. If you want to see what the libretto says exactly, you can go online, but there is no need to maintain that kind of racism in the translation. I think it's the right way of doing it. But again, uh, it depends from the um, familiarity that the audience has with the libretto, which is less and less. I mean, Italians knew to be, used, to, used to know much more about opera than they do now. I mean, really, things have changed. I, my students in Rome, I teach you know, at the university, I have undergraduates, many, most of them have never been to the opera. Now, this would have not been the case even 20 or 30 years ago. So the level of familiarity is much lower now than it was even a few decades ago. Uh, also, the level of um, musical literacy, you know, pick, being able to pick up, you know, Butterfly is full of originally Japanese themes. I mean, Puccini sort of went to great lengths to educate himself about Japanese music. Of course, then he changed it. But I wonder how many among us now hear bits of Butterfly and go, oh, that's a Japanese tune. Mm. Again, fewer than it was the case half a century ago, and I think even fewer than it was the case when Butterfly was first performed. So again, even the level in, in which the music takes on um, racial representation differs. Again, it depends, as I was saying, from where, when, and for whom exactly. Any more questions, observations? Hi. Um, I just have a follow-up question to the question before this one about mm -hmm. the cinematography aspect. Yeah. Um, I understand where you're, what you're saying when you, when you say if we're watching it on stage, like from the audience perspective, it's a very different experience than when you're watching it from a film. But do you think should an opera company decide to have it recorded, then they should have the understanding now the new context the opera is being placed in? So then, because now they're going to be, I guess, scrutinized in that TV show mm -hmm. realm that you mentioned before, mm -hmm. then now they have to adhere, I guess, to those social expectations that we're saying that it um, should not be. I, I, I don't think I'm in a position to say they should or they shouldn't. I, I, it's not, I mean, I, I don't think I have that kind of power. And uh, what I can tell you is that they are increasingly doing it, ever more. You know? uh, attitudes have changed significantly over the past. Well, look, we are talking less than 20 years because DVD is what really changed. There were videotapes before, but not very many opera performances were videotaped. It was when the arrival of DVD and then internet, but especially DVD, that things changed dramatically. When was that? When did DVD arrive? 1997 in the US, 1998 in Europe. I remember it, you, you don't. <laughs> it was a huge revolution. And at that stage, increasingly, opera companies, you know, they're huge institutions and they are slow to change, very, very slow to change. But as an increasing number of productions are, are videoed, they go on DVD and then on the internet. You know, YouTube started to uh, host, be able to host videos longer than 15 minutes in 2005, so 11 years ago. So it's only then that you could have whole operas on YouTube, and YouTube really, again, has changed things dramatically. Um, so opera companies are slowly realizing that one thing is putting an opera on the stage, quite another is to put it on video. Huh? And here I think the, um, is not only the casting director who has a responsibility, but also the director of the video. It's difficult to find the balance between the kind of things you expect to see as if, you were look, as if you're watching, you know, Downton Abbey, I don't know, something like that, and quite a different thing trying to convey 
the feel that you are in a theater, not, go, not getting too close. Uh, in my view, video directors uh, should think harder, I think, a bit harder. Like I, I use the word should, which I don't like to, but anyway, I think they, sh they should try harder. But casting directors as well. Um, I think at the moment, uh, things are, in a sense, improving, and let's say uh, opera companies are more mindful than they used to be. I think there is a lot of room for improvement ahead of us. Well, I hope you all will join me in thanking again Professor Sinichi for a really illuminating talk. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.